happy to take questions if you want me to deepen some of the threads. So I'll try and uh, uh, introduce the field in all its various you know, dimensions, not all, but as many as we can possibly have. So medical humanities, as the term itself suggests, uh, is about medical culture. You know? So when we say medicine, of course, there's a technical training uh, that medicine involves, the training that doctors uh, undergo. But there's also a medical culture around that. And literature, very simply, is a cultural form which has depicted medical tropes for a long, long time. Okay? And uh, it's not just uh, modernism or modernist literature of early 20th century, but it goes back a long, long way, even back in uh, Elizabethan period and so on. But I would be principally talking about modernist literature in relation to medical humanities for two reasons. One is that many of these practices of modern medicine come into being in the 20th century, almost alongside the important developments of modernist literature. And the other reason being more personal, because that's my research feed and that's what I work on. Uh, so I would give examples primarily from modernism, but that does not mean this kind of approach cannot hold up for other literary periods. Uh, right. So medical culture is what we are talking about. And uh, to start with a literary example, because I'm primarily addressing a, literature, a crowd of literature students. So uh, I suppose all of you are familiar with the opening lines of T.S. Eliot's famous poem, uh, Love Song of J. Alfred Prufock. And the first three lines go like this. Let us go, then you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go, then you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. This is a classic example of what I was talking about, medical trope within the literary text, medical metaphors, medical similes, medical culture, let's say, being represented in literature. So uh, why would this very romantic walk of the you and the I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, be compared with a patient who is etherized upon a table? It's a question, right? We know Eliot's own sort of uh, critique of romantic poetry. And this could be an attempt to disturb and dislodge the romantic ethos set up by the first two lines. But it resonates with us. You know, all our, uh, let's say, you know, intimate walks have become, in a way, shadowed by this strange, imperceptible virus. So, uh, Eliot compares the way the sky is spread across, or the evening, to be more precise, the way the evening is spread out across the sky. He compares that with the condition of a patient who is anesthetized and lying unconscious on the table in an operation theater, let's say. So why this medical metaphor, which barges into a, a very quietest romantic image of two people walking together in the evening when the time, as it were, is spread out, curtained across the sky. Why this medical metaphor? Now, what is interesting here, and this is something that I want to open with, is that if we go back to the etymological origins of ether, we have a possible answer here. You know, So we are thinking of how a poet would associate one image with another and how one image will emerge from another. So when Eliot talks about the evening spread out against the sky, the sky is the anchor word here, which could connect him to something like etherize, because ether is the common connecting trope between etherization, the medical term, anesthetization, and the absolutely non-medical term, ethereal. I mean, most of you would be familiar with the word ethereal, which means heavenly. So ether, the waves of ether, uh, it has a certain connotation in physics. Uh, the medical aspect comes in through the process of etherization or anesthetization. 
And then ether could also represent the sky, the sky that was spoken of in the second line. So that is perhaps Eliot's transition from the second to the third line, from sky to etherization. But what we see there is that the word etherization can mean multiple things, right? That's what we just discussed. Sky, uh, the ether waves, as well as, let's say, anesthetization or etherization of a patient. Etherization as a word was used in medical science from as old as, you know, 18th century, 18th, 19th century as well, if we go to the medical journal. So it was a word very much in vogue at the time when in the beginning of 20th century, Eliot was writing this poem. But the point I want to make by evoking these three lines is that what is medical is also appropriated by literature. So what we have is a linguistic culture of literature that appropriates the medical trope. It is not only medical. Yes, there is an image. The medical image is evident. The image of a person etherized upon a table. But as I was suggesting there, etherization as a process also meets this other meaning of the word ether, which is non-medical, which is more of a landscape image, you know, so or perhaps a scientific image, but not a medical image as such. So the 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 line between the medical and the non-medical is quite thin in literature. And sometimes literature will not just reference medical practices, but it will also turn around medical practices to its own end which is important, right? And again, we see this, uh, for example, in a text like, you know, Sol Zenitsyn's The Cancer Ward, a uh, major modernist European text, where the cancer ward is a medical metaphor. You know? And we see those medical metaphors, for example, in a lot of existentialist philosophy, uh, you know, famously perhaps in Soren Kierkegaard's Sickness Unto Death. The, the idea of existence as a kind of sickness. But again, the point I'm trying to make is that if, if we couch human existence as a kind of sickness unto death, that is not necessarily a medical metaphor because you are expanding the field of the metaphor to cover the whole of you know, human existence. And that neutralizes the medical dimension of the metaphor. Now that we're talking about medical metaphor, medical culture, as you know, language is, of course, the vehicle of culture. So when we talk about medical culture, we have to talk about medical language, the kind of language doctors use to talk to patients, the kind of language patients use to talk to doctors. So, you know, the patient doctor relationship and the linguistic culture around that patient doctor relationship is a major, major uh, question that is always addressed in literature on medical humanities. Uh, to, again, uh, open up the field, let me talk about some, Im some important works here. So Alan Bleakley is one of the most important figures in what is called medical humanities now. Alan Bleakley has written a lot on medicinal practices. Uh, and again, interestingly, these are all people who have had a medical training and then they've turned to philosophy or literature or, you know, mental health, uh, some of the other therapeutic techniques which have uh, perhaps a, a little more of a, an affective human dimension. I'll, I'll come back to these points. But Alan Bleakley was one of the uh, initial figures to have also coined this term, medical humanities. Uh, and he was a medical doctor, as I said, who shifted gears a little bit. So. Uh, Bleakley, uh, let me mention one work here, uh, Metaphors in Medicine, and because we were talking about metaphors there. So Bleakley has written at length about metaphors in medicine. Uh, Thinking with Metaphors in Medicine is the name of the book, in case you're interested. It came out in 2017. Alan Bleakley, Thinking with Metaphors in Medicine. And Bleakley does a detailed analysis of medical metaphors, the kind of metaphors that are used in medicine. For example, he talks about an archetypal metaphor that we are also using now in the COVID situation. If you if you notice war, the metaphor of war, you know, uh, medicine as a kind of war. 
and the body as a machine. These are also didactic metaphors that are used to teach medicine in medical grad school, right? So these are didactic metaphors, metaphors that are used in teaching. Uh, medicine as war and body as a machine. So these are mechanistic metaphors he criticizes and he generally you know, talks about the importance of metaphor in medical culture, but also criticizes certain kinds of metaphors that could uh, perhaps lead to stigma, you know, that could stigmatize a disease. And again, for literature students, we kind of go back in time, and he does mention uh, Sontag here. Uh, there's a famous book Sontag wrote. It's a smallish essay, actually, which came out in the form of a book, Illness as Metaphor illness as metaphor 1977 so sontag and when she was writing this book when this came out medical humanities as a field hadn't really developed the way it is developed now i mean now we have centers for medical humanities in in various places uh, we again we could talk about this later on if you are interested but uh, susan sontag in this particular book famously argued against the use of metaphor in medicine let me quote Sontag here, and this is a famous quote from the book. My point is that illness is not a metaphor, and that the most truthful way of regarding illness and the healthiest way of being ill is one most purified of, most resistant to metaphoric thinking. Yet it is hardly possible to take up one's residence in the kingdom of the ill unprejudiced by the lurid metaphors with which it has been landscaped. It is toward an elucidation of those metaphors and a liberation from them that I dedicate this inquiry. So the important point is she wants to liberate medicinal practices from metaphors. Of course, this sounds like a slightly absolutist position to take, and that's why bleakly you know, does offer a partial critique of this, but she also takes the point, uh, Blakely also takes the point that uh, metaphor can cause stigma and abuse. And Susan, Susan Sontag realizes this as a practicing writer. So she's not really a medical humanist. She's more of a practicing writer, uh, a literary critic, who is able to understand the abusive and stigmatizing nature of medical metaphors. For example, Trotsky called Stalinism the cancer of Marxism. This is a metaphor she uses in the book. Trotsky called Stalinism the cancer of Marxism. So we are talking about medical metaphors in a non-medical context, you know, and the violence that might inflict. Let's mark the difference from this work, Susan Sontag's work, and Alan Bleakley's work. Alan Bleakley is not talking about medical metaphors violently used in non-medical contexts. In fact, he's talking about metaphors that are part of the medicinal practice, that are part of the medical practice. And there could be a therapeutic value in metaphors. Metaphors that come in not just from the doctor, but from the patient as well. So uh, just an aside, in psychoanalysis, we use the word analyzend rather than patient, uh, with a certain respectful acknowledgement that the real analysis is performed by the analyzend, not the analyst, not me, but the person who comes for analysis. Now, uh, as you would know, I suppose most of you are native speakers of Bangla. Uh, the word shusrusha, shusrusha etymologically means shonbar icha, the desire to listen. So care and cure, these are two major you know, uh, tropes that have produced a lot of literature on them in medical humanities. There are multiple books written on both care and cure. We may come to some of these things later. But uh, shusrusha or cure is about shonbar icha, the desire to listen. And in fact, I would go so far as to say in psychoanalytic training, what we hear is a particular kind of listening. What we are trained about is primarily a very special kind of listening. So we have to listen, not just attentively, 
but by switching off our own subjectivity, which is extremely difficult, by the way, to listen to the other by completely switching off your subjectivity. And at the same time, that does not mean uh, a certain older idea of scientific objectivity. You have to identify in certain moments. You have to support and direct the therapy. But at the same time, you cannot entirely be at one with the patient. So a distance needs to be maintained. And at the same time, while listening, you have to empathize, care. But at the same time, you have to listen not from within your own subjectivity. You know, that's the you know, complicated uh, sort of kind of listening we are talking about. Again, for those who are more interested, you could read Bruce Fink's book, Bruce Fink. He has written a book called Techniques of Psychoanalysis, Fundamental Techniques of Psychoanalysis. The first chapter of that is on listening. So if you're interested, you could do that. You could read that particular chapter. Uh, let me come back to medical humanities at large. So Alan Bleakley talks about this therapeutic dimension of medicine as well. Uh, how sometimes, you know, let me give an example. Uh, patients are able to come up with a metaphor for their illness. And that might have a therapeutic value. The very fact that they've been able to metaphorize their illness can alleviate their pain to a certain extent, can help them recover to a certain extent. So these metaphorical practices are not all evil or stigmatizing. And that's a, that's a very interesting point that Bleakley makes uh, contra Susan Sontag. Let me move on to another absolutely crucial figure when we talk about medical humanities generally and also very specifically medical humanities and literature. I'm talking about uh, someone called Rita Sharon, who is again a medical practitioner, a surgeon, a doctor, who later took to literature, did a master's degree in literature, did her PhD in Henry James, some of you might be aware of Henry James's work. Again, there's a mental health connection because Henry James's uh, brother, William James, was the one who wrote principles in psychology and the one who created this term that we often use to talk about modernist novels, stream of consciousness. Henry James was the writer Rita Sharon worked on for her PhD. And Rita Sharon came up with this very interesting framework of narrative medicine. Let me talk about this a little bit. So we are moving a little bit away from metaphors to now narrative, narrative as a, as a, as a more sort of holistic act within uh, medicine. So Rita Sharon's point was in medical training, we are not taught to listen to the patient's illness narratives. And, and we are not taught to necessarily acknowledge them as a human subject. This is a very important point. Again, to use a, an example that most of you could be familiar with, a popular cultural example, let's say, if you've seen the first installment of, of the film series called Munna Bhai MBBS, if you, if you remember the first film in that series, Munna Bhai MBBS, in a way, that entire film is about medical humanities. Because, uh, again, for those of you who have watched the film, uh, just remember the person who is absolutely still throughout the film on a wheelchair and starts talking finally at the end. The whole film emphasizes this idea of empathy, not to treat the patient's body as a machine, but to treat the patient as a human subject, to try and listen to their narrative. In this case, it's extremely difficult because that person does not talk. In fact, he de doesn't even bat his eyelid. So, of course, I mean, doctors are faced with extremely difficult situations like this on occasions. Again, just as an aside, let me also mention this, uh, this epidemic that happened uh, in, uh, in, in early and mid 20th century, uh, an, an epidemic that uh, uh, is discussed uh, at length in the book Awakenings by Oliver Sacks. Uh, Oliver Sacks is a doctor who wrote this book called Awakenings. So these were a series of patients who had lapsed into a kind of uh, 
elongated sleep for years. They would not wake up for years. Again, literature students can think of something like Rip Van Winkle, who doesn't wake up for years. And finally, when they did, because Oliver Sacks used a, a, a new uh, drug, L-Dopa, uh, what kind of experiences did they talk about? It seemed like they were stuck in time. So some of these patients had been in a deep sleep for almost three decades. And when they finally woke up, they didn't realize they had aged. They didn't realize that they were in the 1960s, let's say, or 70s. They still thought they were in the late 20s or 30s. And uh, a very interesting example of medical humanities and literature in practice is Harold Pinter, uh, the, the British playwright. He wrote a play on these patients. So he read Oliver Sacks's book, Awakenings. Uh, he was deeply fascinated by the medical condition of these patients, uh, especially one particular uh, uh, lady, Rose, Rose R. And he wrote a very empathetic and extremely interesting play called A Kind of Alaska, A Kind of Alaska, which was essentially the, you know, the reworking of one of these patients' narratives. So Pinter... Uh, sent the play to Oliver Sacks in 1982. Uh, and Oliver Sacks mentioned the play as a wonderful transaction happening between medicine and literature in the 1999 edition of Awakenings. The book was originally published in 1973. Pinter took almost 10 years to read and write on the basis of one of the case studies in that book. So this example I wanted to give because we see an actual transaction happening here between medical humanities and literature. But let me move on to talk about Rita Sharon. That was an aside. So uh, Rita Sharon in this framework of narrative medicine talks about a new kind of training for the doctors and medical professionals who will now be taught not the nitty gritties, but the fundamentals of narrative literature. You know, how do we close read a text? What are the things we are reading for in a literary text? We read the form of the text. We read the, the narrators, the metaphor, the metaphors of, of you know, uh, language, the, the, let's say, the genre of the text. You know? So uh, this book, again, is something that I would definitely suggest to all of you. Narrative Medicine. It's a very lucid book uh, written in 2006 uh, by Rita Sharon. So let me just introduce the idea because there are other things that I want to at least mention briefly. Uh, so Rita Sharon defines narrative medicine like this. Let me quote her. I use the term narrative medicine to mean medicine practiced with these narrative skills of recognizing, absorbing, interpreting and being moved by the stories of illness as a new frame for healthcare. Narrative medicine offers the hope that our healthcare system, now broken in many ways, can become more effective than it has been in treating disease by recognizing and respecting those afflicted with it and in nourishing those who care for the sick. So the important point she's trying to make here is that every patient, and we are not talking just about mental health here, we are talking about all kinds of health crisis. So every patient has a story to tell. And Rita Sharon's critique is that doctors often do not pay or cannot pay much heed to those stories. Perhaps they don't have the time, perhaps they don't have the uh, energy, perhaps they don't have the competence. It's this question of competence that Sharon, as a doctor herself, who has taught herself literature and literary theory and, and narrative theory, she takes it upon herself, and she's quite a visionary in this, right, I would say, uh, who takes it upon herself to perhaps, you know, offer a corrective to medical pedagogy, to medical teaching. And let me give you an example, which will, I think, vivify this. Uh, and this is Sharon's own example. Again, let me read, let me read her beautiful prose. An 85-year-old woman with bad asthma comes in to see me. I've known her for almost 20 years. 
we have managed to decrease her hospitalizations and emergency room visits dramatically over the years and so she is grateful and i'm proud today she sits and weeps i know that her 28 year old grandson just last week drowned in the ocean of miami i know that her son this dead man's father was shot to death on the streets of harlem at the age of 36 she sits next to me and she weeps her english and my spanish enable us to reach one another her pain is unbearable suffering again the loss of her son by virtue of the loss of her grandson she is overwhelmed by her grief yes she prays to a god she still feels near yes she is comforted by the presence of her daughter yes she allows herself to talk about her two lost men she knows that time will heal her pain and she knows to wait i weep with her unable to fathom her agony but able to honor her bereft state i listen as she tells of her anguish knowing that her telling of it is therapeutic i will see her next week and the week after that not to fix anything but simply to watch with her to listen to her to behold in awe her faith and power and love it's a wonderful passage that demonstrates what we are talking about to treat the patient as a human being to engage with the patient to partially at least identify with the patient and for a medical doctor who is not a mental health profession a professional to be able to do this is is quite interesting and it's it's, it's definitely a development a more recent development and as she says elsewhere in this book again this book is strongly recommended to anyone who wants to pursue this line of research so uh, she insists on this particular point that the doctor has to enter the world of the patient the doctor has to make an effort to enter into the world of the patient the patient may not always give access the patient may be a little resistant but the doctor has to open up and if the patient is opening up the doctor has to listen and has to you know permit that opening this is again uh, a long standing discourse in mental health of course where we talk about non judgmental listening identificatory listening but at the same time not as i was saying not trying to listen to someone from my own subjective position because that's the kind of narcissistic listening we often perform but that that is not the kind of listening we do uh, in psychoanalysis or in fact i would say even in many other psychotherapeutic techniques such as narrative therapy and so on so Sharon is again in a figure I wanted to mention in this context like Bleakley she's also a very important figure now I would not spend a lot of time uh, I'm aware of time but let me quickly talk about literature as such a little bit more so we were talking about narrative medicine and how literature becomes a part of medical training okay uh, that is something that Sharon especially insists on bleakly also incorporates art and literature and other kinds of you know uh, techniques of literature let's say uh, again if you read the book on medicine you will see a whole chapter being dedicated to that uh, but i was also making a slightly different point earlier if you remember that literature has always taken a cue from medicine and the point there is that medicine is also a kind of art you know if we go as far back as uh, an essay that you know we don't read as much nowadays which is the reason why i teach this essay in my literary modernism course here in iit for the master of arts and uh, btech and and mtech students as well so uh, there's a there's an essay uh, that emily zola emil zola the french uh, uh, writer french novelist he wrote an essay called the experimental novel uh, this was written in 1893 what is interesting is that the entire framework of experiment that he you know uses in this in this essay it's a long essay uh, he draws this from biology and he draws this from medicine 
Claude Bernard, one of the forefathers of what is called the experimental method in biology. It is from Claude Bernard that Zola draws this idea of experiment. So we have seen this a lot in literature, you know, and, and, and again, and so many uh, you know, examples uh, that we would perhaps uh, we could give. Another uh, important question, as I said, uh, apart from uh, you know, care and cure, again, we could come back to these things. There's work that has been produced on the idea of medical care, how care perhaps needs to be foregrounded over cure, because cure might be an uncertain thing. Uh, and not just in mental health, but also in you know, uh, organic physical health situations. Uh, cure uh, is an important question, of course, there's no denying that. But there has been a certain, let's say, displacement of cure through care in literature on medical humanities. Medical humanities as a field has acknowledged and started to acknowledge cure uh, as perhaps secondary uh, and care, the process, cure is the end in a way, right? So cure is the end, care is the means. But care is perhaps in certain ways what is in our hands more than cure. So care has been very significantly theorized in medical humanities. Uh, the other uh, important uh, tropes, I'm talking about certain themes that have been read through medical humanities in literature. I've already talked about medical culture, metaphors, the doctor-patient relation. Again, you could think of how many 19th and 20th century novels have the doctor figure. I mean, famously, of course, in George Eliot's uh, novel, uh, uh, Middlemarch, but also in novels that are not that widely read. For example, in Juna Barnes's novel, Nightwood, uh, we have a doctor who is one of the most significant, perhaps the most significant, choric character. So we have depiction of doctors, medical professionals, in literature for a long, long time. That has been a sort of major area within medical humanities and literature. Then the representation of various diseases, that has again been a major point of discussion. For example, there's a book on amnesia in literature, there's a book on not just disease, but other medical phenomena, like even breath. There's a whole book written on breath and literature, you know, from a medical humanities perspective. So again, those of you who are interested could look up the Routledge Medical Humanities series. It has excellent books on medical humanities and literature. That's why Bleakley's book also features. Uh, there has been a political interest in the power dynamic within the medical fraternity, the bureaucracy of it, the institutional framework there, the, the hegemonic power of the doctor has been questioned in a lot of those you know, politically oriented medical humanities kind of work, which again talks about something like violence in medical institutions uh, you know, and, and violence coming from both ends, not just from the doctor's end, but also from the patient's end. As we know, we know those narratives, right? The narratives of violence, but whether care could also be coercive whether medical care in these care homes could also be coercive. That has also been kind of you know, discussed and, 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 and talked about. Then the, the theme of trauma, uh, as you know, the theme, of, the theme of trauma is a major theme in literature. And again, a lot of trauma studies, what has developed as a research concentration, trauma studies, that has taken into its fold the technique of reading literature through medical humanities, because trauma, again, is a medical phenomenon, but it has its own deeply human psychic ramifications, which we see, for example, in a lot of literary texts. Just to give one more recent examples, example, uh, there's a book called Trauma by Patrick McGrath. He's a, he's a British writer. Uh, he wrote a book called Trauma in 2008, which was about a uh, a psychotherapist, a psych, psych, not a psychoanalyst, but a psychologist, a practicing psychologist. So the narrator of the book is a practicing psychologist and the central character. But then we ultimately understand how the book is talking about his own repressed trauma. So the trauma of the psychotherapist, not the trauma of the patients. And again, uh, there's this particular uh, term 
that Bleakley has used quite a bit in his work. Let me mention it here while talking about the power dynamic, uh, what he calls patient directed medicine, patient directed medicine. So what if the process is directed by the patient and not by the doctor? What are the ramifications of that? Clearly, that's a subversion of the power dynamic where the doctor is on top and the patient is uh, underneath him, as it were. So uh, and also there's been a lot of discussion on gender dynamic. Right. So uh, gender plays a very important role. The increasing number of women uh, in medical practices, uh, that has been a, a major area of discussion in medical humanities, how the, you know, the difference is marked out. So I'm again going to mention a book that some of you might want to follow up, uh, Cambridge Companion to the Body, Body. Uh, body, again, is one of those very important medical tropes in, uh, in, in literature. Uh, if we medicalize the body, that kind of literature, the literature that medicalizes the human body, of course, opens itself up to readings through medical humanities. Okay, so the body is a very important question here. So in uh, this book, uh, which is a collected, uh, it's an edited volume of essays, uh, Cambridge Companion to the Body, uh, there's a discussion, for example, on how the medical culture changes when deliveries of babies, uh, you know, pregnancy uh, is managed more by female doctors than male doctors. So when female doctors start coming into the process of delivering a child, what kind of change does that trigger in the literary representation of the body? One of the chapters in this book talks about that. So just to again flag the question of gender, power dynamic around gender as well. Because there are certain gender stereotypes. Even now, uh, a lot of uh, cultural stereotypes of the doctor is uh, always male and the nurse uh, as always female. So again, we need to question those gender stereotypes. And there's been a lot of work on that. Uh, I'll close now with some examples in literature again, just as I gave the Pinter example. Another interesting example in peripheral modernism, let's say. I mean, she's not considered one of the more mainstream modernist writers, but an extremely interesting writers, writer. Any one of you who's interested uh, can follow up. Anna Kavan, her name, her actual uh, name was Helen Emily Woods. She took up this name, Anna Kavan, after she came back from asylum. So she had a, a, a long history of substance abuse, drug addiction, and things like that. She took up this name, Anna Kavan, and started writing novels in this name, in this uh, literary pseudonym, after she came back from the asylum. She wrote these stories in 1940 called Asylum Peace. It's a series of short stories written in the asylum. And then after she came back, she had already written novels, by the way, as Helen Emily Woods. But she came back and wrote this uh, most famous novel, Ice, in 1967, uh, a year before her death. Uh, in 1967, she wrote this book called Ice, which again could be seen uh, through medical humanities because it's a it's an allegorical representation of her state of drug addiction. So what kind of world is it for a drug addict? For a person suffering from drug addiction, what kind of world, uh, what kind of world are we looking at? What does the world look like to a person like that? Uh, again, staying with Anna Kavan, another very interesting example is, you know, going back uh, in time uh, in her life, uh, in 1949, she wrote another book, which is extremely recalcitrant, difficult to get. Uh, Ice is still uh, sort of a cult masterpiece, but uh, this book is sadly enough, uh, very rarely read. The Horse's Tale. In 1949, she wrote this book called The Horse's Tale. I mentioned this for a very particular reason, because she wrote this book with her doctor. She was undergoing psychotherapy with a psychotherapist called K.T. Bluth, a German psychotherapist. She co-authored this book with her own psychotherapist, The Horse's Tale. 
uh, which makes it a very important book for medical humanities and literature. Because here we have a doctor and a patient writing a book together. You know, what does that mean? What kind of therapeutic dimensions are we talking about? Writing uh, in literary sense has to be seen as a kind of therapy. Again, there's a lot of literature that you can follow up on if you're interested on writing as therapy, writing therapy. Just as there's narrative therapy, there's narrative medicine, there's also writing therapy. And literature, literary texts, have always been, in a way, a witness to the therapeutic agencies of writing. Uh, again, I mean, there, there are so many examples one could go into, but uh, for purposes of time, uh, I'll just mention one final example and stop there. Uh, pathography is a term that is used in medical humanities to talk about the narrative of the, the sick person, let's say, whoever is on a sick bed. Uh, so pathography is how uh, a person, let's say, in the hospital narrates their own situation. You know? So again, we have many such examples of pathography. One very important uh, uh, example from the European modernist canon would be, again, a novel going back in the 60s. I don't know if you've heard of this writer, Thomas Bernhard. Thomas Bernhard, B-E-R-N-H-A-R-D. He wrote a book called Frost in 1963. Bernhard is, again, considered one of the most important Austro-German uh, modernists uh, in the 20th century. So Bernhard's book, Frost, is about a medical intern who is asked to observe his doctor's brother. So he's a medical intern. He's doing his internship under a doctor, Dr. Strock, And he's asked to go to this remote village to observe the painter brother of this doctor, who is another Strock, of course. So this painter is you know, considered mentally unstable. And the intern is asked to observe this mentally unstable painter. And that's what the entire narrative is all about. So as you can see, the, the narrator is a medical intern. And the entire novel functions like a pathography, you know? a, 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 a case note, let's say, or a case study for the, the so-called mad painter. And of course, goes without saying madness, symptom, these are all you know, very important terms that are associated with medical humanities as a field. In fact, uh, one of the first volumes of the Medical Humanities Companion is on symptom. So it goes without saying how important these terms are. Um, yeah, let me finish with uh, you know, an example uh, close at hand. Uh, sickbed narrative, of course, is an old enough tradition in literature. So what I'm trying to say here is that medical tropes have always been there in literature. It's only now that literature has traveled to the doctors in the field of medical humanities. Not now, but in the last 30, 40 years. And they've become more, uh, they've woken up, let's say, to literary aesthetic techniques. But literature and art has always depicted medical situations, medical professionals, medical dynamics. So a uh, sickbed narrative is, again, almost a subgenre. You know, we see so many of them. I already mentioned cancer word. But just to end with, a, you know, a, 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 a text close at home in Bangla, uh, we could think of a, a novel like, uh, I mean, there are multiple novels, Shondipan uh, Chattopadhyay wrote, which could be considered uh, sickbed narratives. Shondipan, again, was one of the friends of uh, Shunil and Shokti Chattopadhyay, part of the Kritibash uh, poetry generation back in the 60s. Uh, but the novels that I have in mind were written in the 80s and 90s uh, in Ajkal Putrika. So there are multiple novels, such as uh, Akhon Jibon Onik Shatej Shaste Bhara, and his last work, perhaps one of his best, Dhangshir Modhidi Jatra. These are novels set in the hospital. Uh, Dhangshir Modhidi Jatra is set in an asylum, and Akhon Jibon Onik Shatej Shaste Bhara, which is uh, Shondipan's cheeky use of an ad, uh, a contemporary ad. So that novel is again set in a hospital, a medical hospital. And we see a proliferation of medical tropes in his work, for example. 
So, I mean, we see this everywhere in Manik Bandopadhyay again. Uh, there's a lot of reference to illness, sickness. Uh, so in Bangla literature as well, I'll just finish with that. Uh, we have seen this medical troping, especially around questions like illness, trauma, and so on. Uh, so that is something that uh, we could pay attention to. I mean, for obvious reasons, there is not that, that much of work that exists on these regional traditions, but uh, these regional vernacular traditions also demand a kind of work through medical humanities uh, when the literary texts themselves uh, trope medical questions in them. Thank you so much. I'll finish there. So, Preetha, I'm done. I mean, uh, we could have some questions if there are any. I'm done. Preetha, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I'm, I'm done with the talk. I mean, you could go ahead with the proceedings. Hello? A any problem? No, Preetha, I'm, I'm done with the talk. That's what I said. So, I mean, in case there are questions, I'm happy to take them now. Hello, hello? Hello? Preetha, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you, Preetha, but can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, I think the talk, talk has ended on your end. Yes. Yes, yes. So, uh, I mean, it's up to you. If there are any questions, I could take that. Otherwise, yeah, we could call it a day. Yes. It's up to you. Thank you, Arkuda, for uh, this very enlightening talk. And we are now declaring the session uh, open for observations, interactions, and questions, if any. Any of the participants, my dear colleagues, my students, uh, principal, madam, and others, uh, if you have any observation or any question, please share it with us. Turn on your microphone. Preetha? Uh, hello? Yes, madam. Hello? Uh, 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 hello, this is Shrabani. Uh, Shrabani, yes. Please. Uh, 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 with your permission of Principal Ma'am and also uh, Preetha. It, it, it's uh, not clear. It's not clear, Shrabani, please. Uh, hello? Ha. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, is it audible? Yes, yes, now, now audible. Ha. Please. Uh, uh, sir, is it audible to you, sir? Is my voice audible to you, sir? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, for this, like, uh, have been a, you know, participant and, uh, like, hearing it just so, and I, it, 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 it was so wonderful uh, thing, uh, medical metaphors and non-medical context. Uh, in, uh, like, in a new normal life uh, that, uh, you know, we are facing today. It's uh, so much relevant. Uh, it's not a question. I was just inquisitive uh, as a lover of uh, literature, professional student of literature. Nowadays, sir, we are also talking about distancing, social distancing. Now, uh, like distancing, it is a culturally shaped concept. Human sciences produces effects 
which is also called the sensei now uh, i had just uh, you know it was just a query in my mind uh, is this concept of distancing has a space or a place if we are speaking in perspective to uh, medical humanity like it was so enthralling to hear you it just came to uh, you know though uh, uh, my research area is not this uh, uh, it's with minorities and all uh, literature but still you know uh, so if you please enlighten and uh, uh, thank you so much uh, in, uh, you have such a new concept uh, thank you thank you professor majumdar so uh, uh, very briefly that's a very interesting comment i don't know to what extent i can uh, really say something off the cuff which would be interesting but social distancing and as you know the term has also been debated some people have alternatively proposed physical distancing to kind of mark the fact that you know one mustn't distance another person emotionally or uh, in a human sort of way so yes i mean uh, in fact in the situation that is unfolding now it's also interesting as you rightly took the cue how medical culture in the linguistic sense has also coined all these expressions i mean not that we are hearing these words for the first time but these words have a very particular meaning now uh, you know words like quarantine or uh, isolation or social distancing distancing or physical distancing so absolutely i mean there's in fact uh, some work that is already happening in a uh, more popular journalistic platforms if you go to the wire and scroll many of these uh, online journalistic platforms are already writing about the the you know let's say the humanities perspectives that one can have on these you know uh, these situations so yes i mean social distancing as a term it is definitely now part of medical culture but what is interesting is that lexically speaking the two words do not have any medical connotation there you know and again i thought this was also implicit in the comment that you made because in sontag not in bleakly bleakly talks about metaphors in medicine but sontag often talks about metaphors that have a medical connotation but that are being used outside uh the medical context so this again is very interesting if you think of the metaphorization of social distancing as a certain process uh neither social nor distancing as the two words have any medical connotation and yet now they have become a medical term in this context of the pandemic so this is a slightly different movement i would say lexically speaking linguistically speaking it's a movement from the other end where two non medical terms are gaining a kind of medical connotation because of an unfolding context so i would i would that's how i would respond to that question but thank you so much for that thank you uh thank you both shravani and arkada uh, anybody else uh, any comments or observation please share if you have any principal madam would you like to say something hello 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 am i audible uh, if if anybody else has any kind of question or observation please uh, speak up please share it turn on your microphone and uh, let us hear it anyone from the students if you have any questions uh, you can speak up please mm -hmm. uh well uh, i'm getting no no more response uh, so uh, i think uh, there is uh, nothing to say on the listener saint uh, so far and i'm really grateful for uh, this session 
that uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay has agreed to deliver uh, this valuable lecture on medical humanities. This is uh, a topic of wide uh, international interest and uh, in this present situation uh, it has really assumed a special significance. Those who have participated uh, in the session, we are on behalf of the department uh, grateful to all of them. If there is no more question or observation, uh, I would like to ask my colleague Nilan Janadi, Srimati Nilan Janabagji, uh, faculty of our department, with Principal Madam's permission, to deliver the formal vote of thanks. Nilanjanandi, can you hear me? Hello? Um, yes, Pritha, I can hear you. Can you, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Pritha. Thank you, Professor Orko Chattopadhyay, uh, that I could uh, participate and experience this uh, wonderful lecture, extremely informative and insightful. I really hope that the students of our department will be able to take advantage of this uh, lecture because you have explained the tools of medical humanities, the books, the concepts, uh, the necessary tools of thought, the necessary tools with which they can inform themselves. So all these things you have explained so well that it was a basic uh, empowering lecture session, introductory session for them to um, create a narrative of their own with which they can uh, verbalize the experiences of their um, 2020, the kind of uh, unique situation, the uncertainties and the vulnerabilities that we are experiencing every day. Uh, I thank um, everyone who enabled this uh, session, our honorable principal, uh, Dr. Shoma Ghosh. I thank uh, IQAC coordinator, Professor Rupa Shin, and I thank uh, our teacher, counselor, and uh, uh, the convener of the uh, seminars, Mr. Pradipta Mukherjee, on behalf of our department. And uh, it was truly wonderful. And I hope we can have more such sessions. Thank you, Dr. Orko Chattopadhyay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pritha. And um, that's it. Thank you so much again to the entire college and everyone who has put in a lot of work to make this happen. And thank you to all the students who gave uh, the whole session a patient listening. Thank you. Uh, once again, uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, and especially uh, Pooja and Atri who are always there as our technical support, without whom we are all uh, somewhat technically challenged and they have uh, made it possible uh, except uh, some uh, network issues. Uh, we are somehow uh, time and again forced out of the platform and again rejoining. So these things are happening in this digital platform. But overall, it has been uh, a smooth running session. And for that, we uh, thank our technical support above all. Once again, thank you, everyone. And uh, we would like to call the